Good morning, everyone. This is eLearn Chat, uh, episode number 61, I believe. And it is uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time, June 6th. Joined today by Colleen Sun Lee. Colleen Sun Lee. How are you, Colleen? Good morning, Rick. I am wonderful. How about yourself? I am doing really well. And we've got with us today, you want to introduce him? Absolutely. We have in the house today, we have Sardik Love. He is Hello. in Manassas, Virginia, and he'll be talking to us today about how training can become a valued partner to business leaders. Sounds good. Welcome along, Sardik. How are you? Uh, Rick, thanks. I'm, I'm good. Colleen, it's great to see you and hear you this morning. Uh, I'm having a fantastic day, and I'm honored to be here on eLearn Chat. Sounds great. I can get your name right. Here we go. <laughs> For some odd reason, your image went away. There you go. Okay. Sorry. I think Skype wasn't cooperating for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Deke, you're going to talk to you a little bit about how e-learning can be a more integral part or how training can be an integral part of an organization. How to be, I guess, noticed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, um, how to be noticed, how to have influence, and in a time where, you know, we've got the economy starting to improve, and you know, training organizations, HR organizations, have traditionally uh, suffered losses and lack of investment over the last three or so years, in particular. Now, now that things are e easing up a little bit and investment opportunities are coming about, how does the training program in the department actually secure some of those investment opportunities? And so, we'll chat a little bit about some of the. Um, you know, some six, six easy ways that uh, training departments and staff can, can uh, deploy to improve their chances of getting some of those investment dollars. And this is a real valid subject because in so many cases, training departments aren't really noticed. They're there. They're not operational in nature. We've talked about this in the, mm -hmm. in the past where, you know, if you're kind of hiding or you're not operational, people don't know what you do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it is an issue. It is an issue with training. And um, I think it even comes down to who training reports too often, which is are, are not operational groups. So as a result, they don't really know, they don't have the pulse beat of what's going on in a company many times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an excellent point. Yeah. And Colleen, um, Colleen. Yes. Um, in the chat room, anybody, uh, let's uh, see if anybody has any questions. Let's make this interactive. It's a good opportunity. Well, we have, uh, we have the usual um, attendees. We have Leva and we have Larry and Jeff, Dawn, and we have Tom as well. So let's see. No questions so far right now, Rick. I think they're busy right now talking about your new introduction and the app that you use to build it. Oh, <laughs> the little things. Mm-hmm. So we're still, um, they're probably still getting warmed up. So we can probably continue until they, sure. they jump in with some questions. So Sardik, what, what do you think some of the major problems with, with training organizations are as far as getting noticed, make, be, becoming uh, influential? Yeah, great question. I think one of the biggest challenges, quite frankly, and, and, and I see this consistently, is we've read about it, training managers, training staff. Uh, it's a lack of, comes down to a lack of business acumen. They don't, as you alluded to earlier, um, sometimes have the pulse of the organization and what really matters. You know, so a lot of times I'll encounter uh, some of the HR and training folks as part of my consulting practice. Certainly, we work with them. And uh, a great example, I recently went to a, a client, a potential client actually, and, and um, they contacted me and they, they asked me to come in and talk to the CEO. When I asked the, uh, this was a training, uh, senior leader of training, I asked her, what are the biggest pain points in the organization? And the response was, I'm not really sure. You know, and so I think that's, uh, that might be a little bit of an extreme situation, but it's not uncommon. So a lack of business acumen, lack of time you know, training back to the business and alignment, you don't always have to do an ROI. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the managers what they need and getting their operations going. Um, and so that's, that's definitely one of the challenges. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's perfect. I don't really know what's going on. That's that's so typical of of a lot of training organizations that 
Yeah, they, they do training and they do a good job, but they mm -hmm. really don't know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and it becomes an issue because when it comes down to the, the bad things like layoffs, they go first and they go, what happened? Why did we go? It, they haven't mm -hmm. become an essential part of the company. Right. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately in, in many cases, not all, because there are some great, great organizations, oh, sure. great mm -hmm. training staffs out there for sure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it tends to be more of a tactical approach in training. You know, do the job, do what I need to get done, as opposed to the strategic focus. And, you know, in terms of e-learning, uh, I'm on the um, advisory board for the University of Maryland, um, uh, uh, UMBC, University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County, their graduate ISD program. And one of the things that I keep challenging uh, the, the program there is to actually in, embed a little bit around leadership into their program. And they have a very defined and a very exciting program. It's a very strong program there. Dr. Greg Williams does a wonderful job with the instructional design folks there. Um, but they are very much, uh, when it goes into the, the roles after getting their master's, they'll get the, the, they'll be very skilled on doing the job, the tasks. But when it comes to leadership, that's where they then come back and look for other things. And so that leadership or that lack thereof of the, the strategic focus kind of gets in the way a little bit. So, so you see one approach as really focusing on, on the strength of leadership, uh, mm -hmm. really understanding, one, how to lead not only people, but just how to lead a department, how to lead their jobs. Is that, is that mm -hmm. kind of an accurate assessment? That's uh, fairly accurate. Yes, absolutely. Working solely uh, or solo, you know, the um, lone wolves, so to speak, or, or just within your own department. So isolation in the, the, the isolationist approach. Um, doesn't always uh, bode you well when you need to go out and, and work with others. And so leadership doesn't require a title, and, and we all know that in our field, but we tend to not execute on that even though we know that fairly well. That's interesting. I have a, I have a really great question from Dawn in the chat room, and she's asking, as an, in, as an internal, uh, she'd like to have some suggestions for getting my foot into the proverbial door of this discussion. How do you do that? So getting your foot in the door. Great question, Don. One of the things that, um, uh, that you can do, quite frankly, is um, how well are you marketing your, your value to the organization? You know, in the grand scheme of things, ultimately what it boils down to for us as training and HR professionals is what, what is the value add that we bring to our organizations and to the, to the folks that, that basically hire us internally for our services? One of the challenges that we as HR and training professionals um, um, sometimes forget is we tend to do things the way we've always done it, and we're not aligning our activities and our tasks uh, to, to meet those objectives of the organization. So it's really coming back to understanding what are the, the primary needs. We talk in terms of needs assessment. Um, most business leaders are going to talk in terms of gaps in their performance. So first thing I do is look at the business scorecards, find out what are the things that matter, what fascinates our managers and our clients should fascinate us. And when we do that, if we understand the balance scorecards that they're using, what they're being measured by, what their performance uh, success is, how it's being measured, if we understand those things, that will help us to be able to align what we're doing to those, those strategies. Failure to do that, and we have the status quo, and that means our perception is one of less than at value added. What's, what's a good way to start um, for, let's say, a training organization or a training individual? And like you said, there's a lot of lone wolves out there to, mm -hmm. to really get their pulse on what the, what the balance scorecards are, what's going on inside a company. What, what do you recommend? Okay. Great, great question, uh, Rick. Uh, basically, you ask the folks, take them out to lunch. Take your client, your internal clients, take them out to lunch, spend some time in their operations, um, and, and that's really about what you need to do. Uh, for example, one of the things I do as an external consultant, which is just a, an extension of what I used to do when I was internal, was uh, I, I go in and do a cultural assessment is, is what I call it. It's just uh, meet and greet and find out, you know, what are the tools that they use? What are the reports that they have to regularly update? And once I find out those reports, I just ask. You'd be amazed how easy it is to get access to information if you just ask someone. And once you ask someone, they, they see now that you're actually taking a real interest. And all of a sudden, your influence starts to tick up. The trust starts to tick up. And you become a person known for being interested. 
And and uh, and that's one of the things we know about trust and influence. You always hear the the phrase or the quote, "Don't be interesting, be interested." And that's where you you start. So start looking at the balance scorecards or whatever reports they have. Get access to those, and it's just simply a matter of asking. That's good. And and you know what? Lunch never hurts. No, it doesn't. Oftentimes it's, they'll pay. Make, make friends. <laughs> yeah, make friends that's with. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, another thing I think that, that would work is walk the hallways. Get yes. to know people in different departments. Uh, mm-hmm. Like you said, an, an external consultant and an internal consultant are pretty much the same if, mm-hmm. if you make it a point to get out there and, and meet with people, talk to them, mm-hmm. try to figure out what their needs are, and or actually ask them what they do. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. how many people, and, and, and you've, you've seen this, the minute you start asking people about them, they get really happy. Mm-hmm. People love to talk about themselves and what they do mm-hmm. because in, in a company, people rarely do. So, and if you show interest, mm-hmm. they show interest right back. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's sort of funny because as trainers, people in the training area who are very people oriented tend to not go out and mix in companies very often, which is sort of interesting. Mm-hmm. Kind of shyness kicks in all of a sudden. Yeah, I have a little bit of a theory why that is, and and this is not to be constructively challenging for our our peers in in our industry but oftentimes we may not necessarily feel all that comfortable going and hanging out with people in operations because they may we may feel and have a a perception that they're just going to pound us with what we're not doing right (laughs) what we need to be doing more of how we're not performing and meeting their expectations and quite frankly it's quite the opposite if you do exactly what you just said and walk the halls and spend some time and get to know the people you get that that fresh look, right? You know, you get that real time information that you can go back and say, hmm. And now you're instead of being completely reactionary, you're you're able to be a little bit more proactive. And and uh, you're exactly right. We don't do that nearly enough. Now I've seen some organizations. What they do is they make everyone trainers or anybody else mm-hmm. go through a certain operational program where they not only have to mm-hmm. learn the products or services that the people are providing. They have to go out and help maybe build them, do things with them. So they get a little bit dirty. They get out there. Mm-hmm. If they're a manufacturing company, they teach them how to do some simple building, some simple. Mm-hmm. They, they learn what the assembly lines are like. And mm-hmm. then when they go back and teach, they have a really good idea of, of who they're teaching, what they're teaching, and why they're teaching it. Um, mm-hmm. I found a lot of times trainers don't really know why they're teaching something. They kind of have an idea, mm-hmm. but they're not quite sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a perfect example. In fact, one of the things that, that we do in, in my consulting practice, we're a management leadership development organization, um, provider, basically, and we go into the operations. So I do a lot of work with oil and gas, mm-hmm. and as to the extent that I, I've never been offshore, uh, but I've been on rigs that have been on the dock and in, in drill ships, so I could see what, what they do and see the equipment uh, get a flavor for when we're talking about energy isolation. What do they really mean by that? You know, that visual hands-on. And then uh, one of the organizations that we're working with right now is a mining organization. And it just doesn't, when you're talking about leadership and trying to get, you know, buy-in that the client is uh, looking, f- you know, for from the um, from the training and, and HR folks within our, that organization, there is no better way to go and, and demonstrate an understanding and appreciation of what the miners go through than to go underground. And I did that in Kemerovo, Russia. I went hmm. a quarter of a mile underground and, and took a three-hour tour so that when we were talking to the leaders to help them encourage their employees to speak up uh, and have that willingness to speak up, I could say from personal experience, you know, so when someone is drilling those, those uh, pipes into the ceiling that help prevent uh, collapses of roofs, and they're not spaced appropriately apart, as I saw in XYZ mine, why would that be? That changed the whole dynamic of, as opposed to just talking about speaking up, now I'm talking their language and they know I've been there. Credibility goes like that. Right, right, that's interesting. So how was Russia? It was fantastic, I was there at the coldest part of the year, so it was a little chilly, minus 25 Uh, Fahrenheit. You could have gone to Minnesota (laughs) for that, it's quicker. (laughs) Yeah, true, (laughs) very true. Very absolutely Don, true. Don, and Don in the chat room can tell you all about cold, right? Yes. <coughs> Green yes. Bay. Yep. Yes, you can. Uh, you here's know, an interesting the... point that Leva just made. Uh, how do you teach when you, do, when you don't know why? 
And she's saying that she's uh, being uh, called Ms. Y by her students. She's a college professor in Belgium, Sardique. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, another fantastic question. So there's a couple of things I'll share with you. And, and actually what I'll do is I'll um, eventually I'm going to post a blog article about some of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, so on my blog, look for that uh, uh, pretty soon. But um, when you don't know the why, well, part of the challenge that uh, you, you probably really, you know, I hate to say it, but the reality is you probably need to understand the why a little bit better. So if we're going to increase the value that we offer from our training um, services, we've won, we've got to understand that that increasing of value always requires some form of change. And that means a change in us. So what do we need to be doing? Where do our skills and uh, abilities and knowledge, where are there gaps and deficiencies? Do a self-assessment on our, our needs assessment on ourselves, and and just get a, a basic understanding. You don't have to become a, a financial guru to teach finance and all that sort of thing, uh, but you do need to have a basic understanding. Like me, I don't I don't have an understanding, complete understanding of the oil and gas industry, but I've learned enough and asked enough questions to close that gap so that I'm at least knowledgeable. So you have to be a little knowledgeable around it. One other thing that I would mention is in terms of you know, when you don't know the why, how do you re really make an impact and, and show value added? Well, part of that is look at the circles that you surround yourself with, the people that you work with. If those people don't um, offer you an opportunity to increase your skills, your knowledge, you're, you're kind of stuck in the same old, same old, your status quo, your normal habits. So you have to break that routine to understand the why in some cases and to build the perception outside of your team and outside of in the client base that you understand things. And the only way to do that is to do something different. So you have to create new habits. Uh, there's a few other strategies I would share, but those are the two primary ones, uh, closing the gaps and looking at who you work with on a day-to-day -day basis and whether they're reinforcing your understanding of the why or reinforcing your lack of understanding of the why. And it's good to have a, a healthy dose of curiosity. Yes. Be curious. Have, have some fun. People can tell when somebody's interested in something. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work if you go up to somebody and, and feign interest. They're going to figure it out real quickly. Absolutely. Uh, another yeah. wonderful question we have here, Sardik, and it's from Diane. How can IDs help the change management process when training is part of a larger process of change? Okay, so Colleen, I'm sorry, uh, it broke up a little bit. Can you uh, repeat the question for me again? Absolutely. How can IDs help the change management process when training is part of a larger process change? And, and again, I'm uh, sorry to ask this, but you said how can IDs? I'm not sure what that... Yeah, instructional designers. How can instructional oh. designers help the change management process? when okay. the training is just a part of a larger process of change that's going on within the organization. Okay. And you said the person's name was Diane that asked that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Diane. Okay. Okay. So Diane, that's a fantastic question. And in fact, what I would recommend you do is go out and, and here's a book reference for you is uh, change anything by the folks from vital smarts. Uh, you have to really understand the concepts of change management. And that is one of the, biggest things that I see as an opportunity for us in, in training, believe it or not, because we teach train, change management, but for all intents and purposes, when we're initiating a, a training program, we're effectively doing a change management process, but we don't build that in. So we don't account for the, the influences that reinforce the status quo. So the book, To Change Anything, is really focused on the individual contributor and how you can change bad habits or replace uh, uh, destructive or persistent habits, but the concepts are found uh, fantastic because if you understand what are reinforcing, what why people continue to stay in the status quo and why they are resistant to change, aka 75% of all change initiatives fail, or the other way of saying it for our, our purposes for training adoption, why only 10 to 20% of all the training that we ever do in, in a classroom or an e-learning event a uh, process is actually applied back on the job. The biggest challenge for that is there are so many different reasons for the status quo to be there. We're outnumbered. Um, and so for I, instructional designers, IDs, uh, what you have to do is really take an understanding of the change process, how change actually happens, 
why behaviors actually get replaced uh, and habits get changed because uh, organizational culture is just a series of routines that are a collection of individual habits and that's just the way we do things around here is an easy definition of culture if you look at it that way it's just the way we do things around here if you go in and understand what the prevailing norms of behaviors are that lead to those routines in that team that you're trying to affect change in, it'll make it a lot easier. Failure of understanding any of that, and you will continue to be stuck where you are. I think one of the least favorite uh, expressions of mine is, that's just how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the most expensive phrases that any organization, anyone in any organization can say is, this is the way we've always done it. Because mm -hmm. you've effectively, you're selling out the future to live in the moment. And that's a costly mistake, regardless of what you do. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times that's the way we've always wanted just means that nobody's either coming up with new ideas for making it better or mm -hmm. <clears throat> they've, they've come across the best way to do it and, and they know it. But there's always room for some change or improvement. And it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting in a bad economy you see real quickly the companies that don't adapt. And, and I think yes. it comes down to adaptability, which, which is really change management at, at the heart of everything. If you can't mm -hmm. adapt to the economy, to the things that are going on, you, look how many companies have disappeared um, in a bad economy from restaurants to, you know, why is it that on the same block one restaurant goes under and another one is thriving? Mm -hmm. What are they doing differently? Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. I mean, yeah, the economy sucks in, in a lot of ways, but... What do you do around it? Mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. that's, that's the heart of change management, if you will. We change all the time. And then yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, if, if we're not flexible enough to change, then how can we hope anything else can change? Mm -hmm. Another great question I see here. Is there a different way to say change management without saying change management? Absolutely. And again, I, I happen to be a, a person who focuses quite heavily on habits and so rather than talking about change management, when I go in, I just actually use the term habit. What are the habits that, that enable us to get to success or are barriers to our success? And it's funny, when I start talking to operational leaders and sales leaders, that clicks with them rather than coming in and saying, you know, we really need to do this change management process and change management program. Let's mm -hmm. go bring a thought leader in, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's throw that in there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And employee engagement, you know, it's a great buzzword right now. I'll be honest with you. I'm getting a lot of business from just that. And that's our expertise, too, at, at my uh, organization. But the reality is I'm, I'm a relationship coach and, and a, a change agent around uh, habits. So what are the prevailing habits? What do you do day to day? Because if you think about it, when we do uh, job descriptions, in a sense, we're setting up the framework for what the normal habits what the outcome of those habits should be, what success should look like. And so we don't get so prescriptive down at the details because that would be, um, uh, you know, we just, we couldn't be able to manage that way. But, but nonetheless, at the highest levels, we, we use uh, job descriptions and competencies are merely uh, a composite of habits that ultimately result in performance success. So let's talk about the habits that get us to success. And let's talk about the routines that, are a collection of those habits that get us to collective success and vice versa. What are the barriers to um, you know, derailments uh, and prevention of, of the success that we're looking for? So that, that's what I use, and I've used that one for the last couple of years, and it's been extremely effective. I'm sure there's others out there, but that's just one that I found extremely easy to sell and talk about. Oh, that's real good. And we're going to segue real quickly to uh, one of our sponsors, uh, we're going to run a quick ad for the sponsor, and then we'll get back to – this is actually a very interesting topic on change management and, uh, and habits. Uh, but let's get right back to that. Hi, I'm Rick Zanotti. I'm a professional developer, and I need people. I need lots of people from all walks of life and in all poses. I need sequences of people for my e-learning courses. Where do I go? I go to www.elearningart.com. Why? They're the best. Not only are they well-priced, but they've got the best selection and quality of anyone in the industry. You can, too. Go to www.elearningart.com. Click on Subscriptions. And in the Where Did You Hear About Us field, click and type in 
eLearn Chat. That'll qualify for even bigger savings. But you better do it now. This offer is only good through July 6th. That's eLearningArt.com. Go where the professionals go. Well, thank you, eLearning Art, for the sponsorship. And getting back to change management, it's interesting when you talk about habits. You know, you and I talk the same language a lot. I talk a lot about patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of... Uh, and it's the same thing. We get into ruts, if you will. And, you know, it's, it's funny. There's so many things that change games. I like to call them game changers. But, but in essence, let's say you work at a company and the company merges with another company. All bets are off. That's change mm -hmm. at its worst, um, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden you're saying, what are we going to do? Um, people forget many times that when there's that kind of radical change inside an organization, that you may not have a job the next week around unless you do really something to, to ensure that people realize that there is a value to what you do, um, or you're, you're a little savvy in terms of knowing how to move around, how to keep on top of what's going on. But that's, that's also the patterns of behavior. If you're used to sitting back and kind of hiding in a cubbyhole somewhere, mm -hmm. chances are when they find you, it kind of goes back to that old joke uh, that they had on Cheers back when, when the accountant who, I think, what, he worked 20-something years at the same company, and all of a sudden yeah. he gets discovered yeah. and they fire him. <laughs> it's like the oh, first fine. time he's ever <laughs> seen him in 20 years. Who's he? Fire him. Um, yeah. and, and it's kind of what happens with, with patterns and change and habits that mm -hmm. when there is change, we need to change habits, you know, yeah. because the same old, same old will probably not work. Right. Excellent points. Yeah, and, and uh, I know, think uh, someone in the chat room just mentioned that, um, well, let's see here, uh, that organizations, when they hear change management, oftentimes they think of changing out their entire management, like replacing the management. <laughs> fascinating idea i'm sure several people would like that to happen in some organizations <laughs> and that uh, and that does happen sometimes mm -hmm. it does it absolutely does you know and and in a situation like that that that's a very uh, point to point situation like that we we should be certainly using other terms that don't create unnecessary strife stress or or uh, tension mm-hmm um, you know, one other thing, and, and Rick, you kind of alluded to this, and, and Colleen has alluded to it, I think, and I'm looking at some of the, the comments in the chat as well. Two things, two other things that uh, we as training organizations and, and, and professionals really need to look at, and goes right along with this change management concept, is if the way we are operating adds complexity to our users to, to you know, employ our services. So if our LMSs, if our if our sign-up processes, if the transfer pricing for our, you know, who's going to get billed for the, the courses and things that we offer, if all of that is overly complex, you are just creating more headaches for yourself because in a time of change, significant and disruptive change, like an organizational shift, um, such as a acquisition or partnering or something like that, you are absolutely going to be the first on the block because organizations and managers want to root out complexity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we should always be doing, and increasing value as a training organization always requires us to reduce complexity. If we're not reducing, continuously looking for process improvement and continuous improvement, and many of us don't come from that background, so we tend to do things the way we've always done it. We don't, you know, we look at, we get these systems. I remember when I was at Booz Allen Hamilton, and they integrated um uh, a product, I won't name the company, we all know the company, but they integrated the product for their uh, changing out their LMS and it disrupted everything else in the HRIS systems and, and all of a sudden things became very onerous. Um, but it was just the way we had to go at that time because the investment decision had been made. When we do things like that, it, it creates more complexity and it, it reduces our influence and, and they're looking, you know, managers are looking for simplicity, easy easier, cheaper, faster, better. And then the other thing that I would mention too is in terms of increasing value, you alluded to this uh, earlier, Rick, that training and, and training departments are typically kind of out of sight. You know, people know of us when they have a need and they come through the onboarding stuff and the technical training that we do. But we never really sell the value of what we actually do. And so one of the big opportunities, and Booz Allen Hamilton, I'll use them as an example, they had a fantastic best practice model and that's why they continue to win ASTD awards 
uh, when it comes to marketing their programs and the services that they provided. The former um, uh, leader there, Ed Cohen, if anyone knows Ed Cohen, this guy was a genius when it came to and when it comes to marketing training programs. He left Booz Allen, went over to India, replicated the success there. Unfortunately, that organization he went to at the top became the Enron of India. Huh. But just to go to show you, it was bizarre, actually. He had no clue. Um, he went over there and, and built a great organization, won awards there from ASTD. After they went through that Enron situation, he came back to the States, decided to go on his own for a while, and he was doing quite well. And he's a serial CLO, and he's been pulled back in <laughs> inside again um, because the guy is just a masterful marketer. And, and when you look at what people do like him is they market the, the products and services, but they also change the perceptions and the behaviors of the leaders that are our clients. And so if you're not marketing yourself and constantly telling people why you're good at what you do and what the value is that you bring, if you assume that people assume, you know, will know uh, explicitly what the value is that you bring, you're making a, and based on my experiences over many years and traveling around the world doing this, you're making a, probably a tough uh, mistake. Yeah, and that, that's a good point. So in essence, as training organizations, uh, we're talking flexibility, we're talking sales, a little bit of salesmanship, uh, mm -hmm. leadership skills, and and good lunches. Got to have yes. lunches with people. Um, but that, but that, that all comes down to working with people and getting mm -hmm. familiar with what the organization does. Uh, you made some great points with um, – with with really adapting and selling the services mm -hmm. internally. I, I, I agree that the most successful uh, training organizations I've ever come across are very good sales organizations internally. Mm -hmm. They sell the products and services that they provide and they try to integrate it so that it makes sense to to the organization on the whole. Mm -hmm. And and they're valued. And and it's Absolutely. interesting because those are also very org uh, operational organizations. They mm -hmm. don't report to HR. Usually, they report to operations. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just an interesting kind of kind of aside. Or they may have an overarching HR report, but the people internally are are operational in nature. Yes, it's, it's an interesting place to put people. Yeah, I have a couple yeah, of more questions in the chat room. I know mm -hmm. we're approaching the time to wrap up, Rick. But let me just uh, post these two questions to Sardik. One of them mm -hmm. is. What's the best way for an organizational development director, an org dev director, to plan for the development needs of their organization? Okay. So that comes down to strategic planning and developing a plan. And, and the easiest way to look at this is to just look at where you are today uh, and then determine where you need to be over some time interval. And, and I would actually, if you're in a for-profit organization, uh, I would I would say plan that over every quarter because that's what you're being evaluated on. Your performance is down to a quarterly review. Uh, if you have if you're if you're a private organization, you know whatever those cycles are of of interest for management reporting, and and that sort of thing, go along with that cycle. But plan out according to that timeline and make sure that you've got a strategic plan where you're able to measure performance and show progress. One of the clients I just met with yesterday, um, that's exactly what they're asking for is, is a strategic plan for their staff development. And um, I'll give a plug here. ASTD is creating new leadership development program or creating leadership development programs. I think it's in that certificate course. I teach four of their certificate courses. I believe it's in that one. They have um, uh, a model that works very well for setting the plan, a strategic plan for staff development. The acronym is LEADS. So if you haven't taken the ASTD certificate course on creating leadership development programs, uh, that might be one to start with. You'd be surprised at the model that they have in there. And Elaine Beek is the one to design that program. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. program. And then uh, finally, I think this would probably be the last question that we have today. Uh, someone would like to know, uh, do you agree that we need to speed up the instructional design process? And if so, how? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, so I'll pose it, or I'll actually answer it in a, in a different way. Um, I'm not so sure it's necessarily that you need to speed up the instructional design process. You might need to because, in a sense, what I would say is you need to be able to be more agile in delivering results. 
Now, when I say delivering results, I'm not talking about delivering, you know, setting up the instructional design process and at the end of it, you get a course. I'm, I'm talking further than that, that when whatever they do, whatever learning methodology is deployed, that there is a measurable result that happens faster. And to the extent that you can shorten that cycle time, the more competitive, the more value added, the more perceived partnership you're going to get. The longer that cycle takes, the less you're going to have of all those things. I like Sardik. He says mm -hmm. what I say, but much more elegantly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I would have said, you need to cut to the chase. Get with it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but Pretty it's the much. same thing. <clears throat> it is. Yes, elegance really is. Is, is good. Mm -hmm. Well, Sardik, this was a very good show. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Sure. Are you going to be anywhere presenting soon? Any any events, any trade shows that people can come see you at? Um, at the moment, nothing's on the schedule uh, because I've got a lot of corporate events coming up. But uh, what I will say is we are going to be looking to do some chapter events in the upcoming in near future. We've got uh, some interest out in San Francisco um, at the uh, Golden Gate uh, chapter, I think. Um, out perhaps uh, in California, maybe even in Orange County. Mm. Uh, maybe some interest there to come out and do some things. And then certainly down in the Raleigh-Durham area, perhaps in the North Carolina area. So in the, if the, my proposal was accepted, uh, we won't know for a little bit, but the ASTD Leadership Conference in, uh, in Arlington will certainly be there as well if that, that RFP goes through. That sounds great. Hey, if you're in Orange County, give us a call. We're, Colleen lives actually, I guess you're in Orange County or I'm right in close to Orange. Yeah, and of course, uh, for those of you viewing this recorded session, I believe, Sardik, you mentioned earlier that you're going to be following this up with a blog post on your blog, www.think2successnow.com, correct? That's correct. I'm going to mm -hmm. post uh, an, a blog, blog article on the six things that uh, we can do as training professionals and departments to increase the value add and, and have that uh, become a value business partner and it's going to be around what we just talked about wonderful Great, thank Sardique. you so much thanks so much for being here and for all of you in the chat room thanks for being here as well uh next week's thanks. guest or actually our second guest today is going to be mm -hmm. brian jones from e-learning art uh mm -hmm. Sardika, pleasure and we will be in touch real soon in fact i'm gonna send you an email soon i, I think i know some people that could benefit from you all right. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure and an honor being on. And thanks to everyone who's been on the the uh, the chat room, uh, all my friends out there, Larry, Dawn, and everyone else who I've not met. Thank you so much. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks, Bye, Colleen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.